Fort Sill, an historic United States Army post situated in the heart of the great state of Oklahoma. Under the command of Major General Roderick Wetherill, the post offers a peaceful scene today. Excellent training facilities, well manicured lawns, trim headquarters buildings, modern troop billets, all fitting for the home of the American Red Leg, that rare breed of manhood known as the Army Artilleryman. But Fort Sill has not always known the peace that reigns here today. Indeed, the post is steeped in history and rich in Army tradition. Over 100 years ago, Captain Randolph Marcy recommended that an Army post be established at this location to create friendly relations with the Comanche and Kiowa Indian tribes and that celebrated Indian leader, Geronimo. And soon after, General Philip Sheridan personally laid out the ground plan for the new post. Unfortunately, neither Captain Marcy nor General Sheridan, or even Geronimo, could be with us here tonight. Peace with the Indians did not come easily. In fact, in 1871, General William Tecumseh Sherman nearly lost his scalp to a group of Kawa chiefs during a meeting on the porch of what was then, and continues to be, the commanding general's quarters. It was to be nearly 90 years later before another commanding general was to again be nearly scalped on that front porch. And that was in 1958 when General Tom DeShazo first met with chiefs of the Martin Marietta tribe. Instead of the tomahawk, the weapon was called lacrosse. Colonel Jim Unger and Press Flowers immediately recognized the potential of the lacrosse and both contributed greatly toward its phenomenal success. But that's another story. Things have changed since the days of Geronimo and lacrosse. Geronimo is buried on Fort Sill's East Range. And La Crosse lies buried where it last fell. May both rest in peace. <laughs> Meanwhile, technology moved forward, and with it came new plateaus and bigger challenges. One of the biggest challenges was to be a new artillery piece to be provided by the friendly people who brought you La Crosse. In 1957, the Army awarded a contract to Martin Marietta to develop a missile that was to be known as Pershing. Development of this two-stage shoot-and-scoot weapon moved forward rapidly, and in early 1960, the first successful launch took place at Cape Canaveral, Florida. Many Fort Sill dignitaries, looking forward to the day when Pershing would be placed in their inventory, swarmed to Cape Canaveral to witness the historic launch. One of them, believed to be either Howard Von Kennel or Bob Blake, or both, offered 10 to 1 odds. Some contractor personnel were also suspected of having bet heavily on the side of the tube-oriented artillerymen. Finally, the group turned back to witness the missile countdown and launch. And while the tube artillerymen and a few contractors paid their debts to the believers, technology took another step forward. Two years later, Pershing was to move into the hands of troops. The Secretary of the Army joined with General Lou Griffin, Lieutenant Colonels Pat Powers and Ken McDonald and Walt Halsey, among others, to honor the 1st Pershing Unit, the 2nd Battalion, 44th Artillery. Soon after, upon direction of Colonel Jim Norval, president of the artillery board, the second of the 44th moved to Waco Range, where artillerymen fired a Pershing missile for the first time. Before long, other Pershing units were activated, including the 4th of the 41st, the 1st of the 81st, the 3rd of the 84th, and the 2nd of the 79th. Three of the units went to Europe as part of the 56th Artillery Group. 
Annually, these troops were returned to the Four Corners area of the southwestern United States for launch exercises, where under the eye of Ev Haney, they ran up an impressive record. One unit, the third of the 84th, also set the record for distance. In September of 1967, the third of the 84th sent a missile down across Utah, through New Mexico, and over Texas, to impact somewhat outside the normal CEP. The result was an immediate proposal from Martin Marietta to General Kreitz that a contract be awarded to study the possibility of extending the range of Pershing. Meanwhile, technology continued to march on, this time the result of Pershing being assigned a dual role. Under what was to be known as Quick Reaction Alert, or the QRA role, Pershing was to assume a strategic mission in addition to its general support role. To meet these challenges, Pershing needed greater mobility and other improvement, including a faster reaction time and a computerized countdown procedure. The new missile program was to be called, with great originality, Pershing 1A. Winning Pershing 1A was not easy. In fact, there was some argument that perhaps the Navy's Polaris or Poseidon could better take over the QRA role. Quickly, the Department of Army, with help from Fort Sill and the contractor, prepared a position paper outlining the distinct advantages of the Army's shoot and scoot Pershing over the Navy's submarine-launched Polaris or Poseidon missiles. Here are a few of the key arguments. Pershing versus Poseidon. Pershing doesn't have to be waterproofed unless it rains. American generals are better than Greek gods. A Pravda survey shows that 85% of the Russian people prefer to be attacked by Pershing. Pershing begins with a P, followed by an E. Thus, 10 letters ahead of Polaris and Poseidon in the alphabet. If there never is a nuclear war, Pershing will have done just as good a job as Poseidon. Pershing has a smaller warhead. If we blow a mission, we haven't lost as much. <laughs> <laughs> Submarines are unpopular. It was a dirty submarine that sank the Lusitania. You can't put a submarine in a parade. Shoot and swim won't rhyme like shoot and scoot. With these convincing arguments, the Joint Chiefs and DOD authorized the go-ahead for Pershing 1A, then turned to other pressing decisions. And soon the P-1A contract was awarded. The most obvious change in Pershing was to be a shift from tracks to wheels. This provided the required mobility and at the same time contributed to easier maintenance and greater reliability. Some innovative stress tests were conducted by the contractor. As the program progressed, the continued testing at Martin Marietta soon led to a complete deterioration of its roadways with potholes and bumps occurring frequently. Some of the company roads turned to quagmire. It also rained a lot during those early test days. It even snowed some, too. But eventually, the weather cleared and Pershing was readied for its unveiling to DOD, Army, and Fort Sill officials. At the last minute, it was decided that a series of dry runs was necessary to be certain that everything would be ready when the visitors arrived. Time was of the essence. And finally, the visitors arrived and Pershing was demonstrated. 
everything worked like it was supposed to, and Pershing 1A was thus accepted and ordered into production. One dignitary with an eye toward acquiring a civilian skill requested special driver training and was eventually awarded his chauffeur's license. With the first units off the assembly line, Pershing 1A was taken to White Sands where contractor personnel prepared for the first Pershing 1A launch from Waco Range. It was an auspicious occasion indeed, with Colonels Paul Cullen, Ralph Williams, and other Fort Sill representatives there to witness this historic launch. As we said, it was an auspicious occasion indeed, with distinguished Fort Sill representatives there to witness this historic launch. unqualified success behind it, Pershing 1A was now ready for deployment. Under a new logistics concept known as Project Swap, the Pershing 1A system was to be deployed directly from the contractor to troop units, bypassing the normal Army supply pipeline. The starting point was a large warehouse at Cape Kennedy where Pershing 1A erector launchers, programmer test stations, power stations, BCCs, and other equipment would be assembled and wed to the new M656 trucks. All equipment was to be completely tested and finally organized into battalion-sized packages for delivery to the troops. The first such shipment was to Fort Sill. Early in 1969, under the watchful eyes of Ralph Williams and Jack Wolfson, the school troop package was shipped aboard special trains and delivered to the artillery school. Shortly after, another shipment was ready for Fort Sill, this one for the second of the 44th. Once the equipment arrived at Fort Sill, it was deemed prudent that a brief training period be conducted to acquaint the troops with their new system. Under direction of the G3, Colonel Henry Bielefeld, a comprehensive refresher course was inaugurated. There were a few difficulties some of which proved disarming. But soon the bugs were removed and Colonel Paul Cullen declared the second of the 44th ready to set another first. The troops, under orders from Colonel Bob Blake, moved to Utah to establish a launch site. And soon the unit was prepared to test its new P-1A equipment. And again, the second of the 44th made another mark in the annals of Pershing history. With the delivery of P-1A equipment to other Pershing units in Germany, the 7th Army troops were returned to Utah to also launch from P-1A ground support equipment. skies were filled with Pershing missiles and other debris. Here, as a demonstration for General Wetherill, the shoot-and-scoot Pershing is programmed by the second of the 44th to show maximum coverage of a target at close range. Complete coverage of the short-range target is evident. At the same time, the second of the 44th has demonstrated conclusively how the missile can scoot after the shoot. Soon after this demonstration, the second of the 44th, at the urging of Tom Ferguson, became a third of the ninth. It has been a busy 10 years since the first Pershing equipment was delivered to the old second of the 44th at Fort Sill. We've since seen the birth and full growth of Pershing 1A. And we should eventually see Pershing 2. 
We've also seen a lot of good people come and a lot of good people go, either to greater responsibilities within the Army or, in many cases, to retirement and a second career. But wherever they are, those artillery men who played a role in the planning, development, deployment, and doctrine of the Pershing system can be proud of their work. At Martin Marietta, we too are proud of Pershing. But it takes more than workable hardware to make up a system. The big ingredient is people. And during these past 10 years, it has been our good fortune to have worked with the very best of people, the U.S. artillerymen. Thank you.